Right, good afternoon, everybody. I think we're ready to go. Um, everybody finished checking the email, Twitter, and so. Uh, thanks for coming out. We're really excited to be able to talk to you guys about improving your user engagement um, and some of the tips and tips we can help you guys. Um, I'm Catherine McNally, and this is Dave Aspire from Phase 2. I just kind of want to get it out there that we showed up individually this morning wearing pretty much the exact same day. <laughs> and I was a we were supposed to wear base two t-shirts, but we were like, no, we gotta roll with it. So <laughs> they're just not intentional. So um but thanks again. I'm we've got a lot to cover. We're really excited. And um and as I mentioned, I'm Catherine. I lost my hearing to meditators when I was eight months old. And I was one of the first recipients of the cochlear implant, which is a, a technological implantable device. So I've been a technology pioneer my whole life. <laughs> so it's been really cool. So I've grown up and I've lived computers and I'm really excited to talk about how we can leverage technology to bridge communities and equal the playing field for everybody. So David. Hi, I'm David Spira. Um, my background in accessibility started when I was 16 years old when I volunteered to build a computer lab at a retirement home and teach the people living there how to use them and uh, got a immediate and startling crash course on accessibility. Um, we both work for phase two. We're a, uh, we're, we're a digital agency. We design, develop, um, and do a whole bunch of awesome things for various web properties. Um, we're hiring, we have a really interesting booth downstairs, so you should definitely come check it out. Let's dive on in. Uh, the elderly are going to outnumber those under the age of five um, by 2020. This is a thing that hasn't happened before in history. Um, so while they aren't making new, new ones, the baby boomers are the largest, uh, you know, the largest segment and the elderly are the fastest growing segment. <laughs> Um, in America at the moment. And this is happening throughout the Western world. Um, they make up 15% of the population. And this is a group that you cannot afford to ignore. Because 68% of baby boomers, and please, folks, come on in. There's plenty of seating up front if you want. 68% of baby boomers um, have multiple devices. Um, these are folks over the age of 55. And, you know, they're used to using them. As they start to age, they are not like their parents' generation, um, who generally didn't care about use of technology. These are people who are expecting to use technology until they're gone. So don't treat them like you, you know, from a web design standpoint, like the previous elderly generation, who genuinely didn't care. Um, so on top of that, you have this group of one in five Americans who have a disability. Now, this map that you're seeing here doesn't mean much for accessibility, but just to give you a frame of reference, this is um, each state redrawn according to its population. And uh, if we were to go and take a look at the population of people in America with disabilities, it's seven times the population of the state of New York. So this is a large amount of people. Uh, one in five Americans um, we, we, uh, sorry, one in five Americans have a disability and half of them need some kind of assistance navigating uh, a website. So that's 10% of the population, essentially. Are these, is this, do you want to ignore 10% of the population? And then on top of that, you have temporary dis disabilities. A um, friend of mine went uh, snowboarding, had a very interesting fall and left the hospital with both of his hands in casts. Um, these things happen. People have strokes. People encounter all sorts of unexpected ailments that change the way that they see and hear and interact with the world. So this is not just for some niche group of people. We're talking, uh, when we talk about accessibility, we're talking about everybody. We're talking about the elderly. We're talking about people who have the disabilities that you commonly associate with accessibility. And we're talking about people who are you know, living functional lives without any impairments who suddenly find themselves in need of accessibility. This is truly for everyone. So 
let's talk a little bit about colorblindness. And if you've ever attended one of our talks, one of the things that we really focus on is reframing disability and helping people find, you know, find an em empathic connection to these problems. So colorblindness affects half a percent of women. It's a, it, colorblindness is genetic, um, but it, it affects approximately 8% of men. Um, so that's a, an important thing to note. If you operate a website that is targeting men, you're talking about 8% of your audience is colorblind. Um, the Cobalist Colorblindness Simulator is a thing I'm a really big fan of um, because what it does is it allows you to upload images and then simulate um, most of the different types of colorblindness that are out there and see what your designs look like through the eyes of someone else, literally. So on the left, you're going to see a normal image. On the right, you're going to see a different type of colorblindness. Um, it's worth noting there are lots of different types of colorblindness. Um, so red weak. Um, this is what red blind looks like. Blue blind. And then black and white, which is the stereotypical um, but incredibly rare um, colorblindness that most people, I think, think of when, they're, when, when people talk about colorblindness. This isn't actually a very common form of it. Um, let's see if... It's going. Okay, so this is the col Cobalist Colorblindness Simulator. So you can just upload an image. This is Humanitarian ID, an app that uh, I worked on for about a year. And this is what it's looking like through the eye, you know, through different types of colorblindness. You can very quickly, easily, and for absolutely no money, upload screenshots of your designs of your existing websites and um, run them through and see what they look like for, for different types of colorblindness. And what you're looking for is not this, you know, mythic, like, perfect brand experience for, for the colorblind. You're not going to achieve that. What you are looking for is making sure that you can actually read and see everything that's relevant on the page. And the, really, the great thing about technology is that it can enable independent living. People who have a wheelchair or who are blind or who have hearing loss can use technology to get what they need. If you think about somebody who's blind, they can use Alexa at home to call Uber without having to rely on somebody else to drive them somewhere. So they can leverage technology to um, advance the, to make their daily lives easier. Um, one thing that I just kind of want to talk about a very ironic experience when you're thinking about you know, your website and who you're serving and who's your audience and thinking about that, you would be amazed at what kind of sites I encounter in the customer service that I experience. I just want to talk to you about um, the experience I had a year ago when my cochlear implants broke. And let me tell you, when they break, I can't hear a thing. I can't come to work, I can't talk to my family, I can't talk to my friends, but I can't hear them. So it was a very distressing experience. So I have a little journey map of what was going on when my processes were broken. I was, you know, really a low emotional state, like, shoot, I can't function. I can't be productive. My project is broken, so I'm gonna go to the company's website, and say, hey, there's a contact us form. Good, because I can't call them. So I was able to go on the website and say, hey, my project is broken. I need a replacement. I hit submit. Um, you know, the response I got was, hey, um, call us. Really? <laughs> my, you are in the business of providing a hearing device. And the response was, give me a call. You clearly do not know the audience. You do not know who they're serving. Um, and it was kind of a, 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 a bummer moment because I had to call mom. I had to text my mom and be like, mom, keep fix this for me. I, I'm 33 years old and I still need help. And that was kind of a bummer and that really... Um, negatively impacted me as a person and it made me feel like I still needed somebody to help me and I couldn't do this alone. I can't adult by myself. So, um, but now let's look at the ideal experience and what the ultimate experience could have been. So, as we can see, my purchase is broken and I'm waiting. I'm, I'm anxious. So, 
And um, the response I get is, hey, sorry, it's broken. Here are several ways that you can contact us. You can text. You can use the chat widget on our website. Um, you can also email us, and we'll get to a replacement ASAP. Um, usually, they overnight a device. Um, and in the, in the meanwhile, I still need to go to my clinic to literally get my hearing reprogrammed. They put me up to a computer, and then I get a new program from my processors. So I had to go to my audiologist's website. Remember, I can't hear anything. Thankfully, Johns Hopkins, who's just down the road, said, hey, use your online booking calendar to book an appointment with a doctor. And that was great because I could see all the available times that my doctor could see me, as well as mine. So that created a much more harmonious experience. Um, and the great thing was they didn't call me to confirm. They confirmed me in the same way I reached out to them by text means. So they texted me to, hey, an appointment's been confirmed or seen on Thursday. That was good because they didn't call me, which would have gone unanswered. So, um, and you know, and the great thing is my doctor saw me and then she sent me a follow-up email to say, hey, hope it's working out great. So this is a really important experience for you to think about in the audience who you're serving and think about the response and how are you receiving that audience? Are you able to access them? Are you able to give them the means to get in touch with you? And I'm um, so really want to talk here about uh, like future proofing your digital experience. What are those um, temporarily disabling conditions? Are they going to be able to use a site if they don't know how to use a screen reader or if they don't know the keyboard shortcuts? Are those click targets easy to find? Is it easy to understand the web experience? Thinking about those experiences, because not everybody's going to know how to use a screen reader right off the bat. Now, um, I kind of want to go through some, um, some experiences that emulate what it's like for somebody who can't see a screen. Um, and so we're going to um, go through a quick exercise. Um, I'm going to be playing an um, audio description of an image. And I want you to try to visualize what that image is. So. Image, man washing hands. Oh dear. Image, man washing hands. Image. Image. Man washing hands. Image. Man washing hands. Yeah. All right. So what comes to mind? What do you think about when you hear man washing hands? It could be a lot of different images, right? Did it look something like this? I doubt it. Who thought of a surgeon washing his hands? Let me see your hands. I didn't think so. Now, let's talk about writing a good alt text description. Now, one thing I love to do is think about alt text like a tweet. Sure, succinct, and to the point. Now, in that image I just showed you, how about something like male doctor in scrubs, surgical cap, and masks looks on as he lathers up to his elbows with soap to prepare for surgery. That's more descriptive than man washing hands. Wouldn't you say? Good, I'm glad you agree. So consider, think about why was that image chosen? What was the context of that image? Why did someone on the content marketing team say, this is an important image? What does it communicate? What does it convey? Um, and so we're going to be, what is the emotional context of this? Are you a caring website? Do you want to show your know, hospital patients that you care? Um, and uh, hygienic. So we've got male doctor scrubs, surgical cap, and mask. So surgical cap indicates standard of care. It's not wearing really a baseball cap going into surgery. So it's important to say it's a surgical cap. 
looks on, meaning he's observant, he's alert. You know, he's ready to prepare for surgery. Lathers up the open elbows, meaning that he's hygienic. Um, another important thing in preparation for surgery indicates purpose. So these are very important qualities of an image that you want to be able to communicate to a user for screen reader. And it's not just for screen readers, it's great for SEO. Soon you're going to be getting these um, to help your website search. Now, let's do an exercise together. Let's write all text together. So now the context of this is the Red Cross disaster relief. In, um, and there's a disaster going on. So if you would go to Twitter and you go to C. McNally, I have a link that you all can go to and click on from your mobile phone and um, describe this image together. So let's take a few minutes and describe that image. Um, so if you have a hard time finding that link, please let me know. And it's also under David. Twitter handle. So literally, it's going to the um, URL, type twitter.com, C. McNally, and there will be a link. It's my first tweet, my most recent tweet that I just sent out. And, um, and it would take you to this form right here. All right, let's see what came in. Don't be shy. I'm gonna zoom in if I can. So far we've only had one. So we have. We have two now. Yeah, let's, let's go. more time? Okay. All right, I'm going to start reading out some of the responses that came in. Now we've got, um, I'm going to refresh this. Okay, great. Um, two women hike in front of a pile of debris. That's pretty good. Um, but we're missing the context of the America Red Cross. These could be two friends. It's missing the context of an aid worker. Um, we've got American Red Cross aid worker hiking devastated woman surrounded by homewreckers under a blue sky. That's very good. That indicates the disaster had already happened. And this is the recovery process. This is the rebuilding process. So that's, that's definitely a good description. Women embrace relief worker with a hug as they stand in front of a pile of ruins. Also good. Volunteer hugs, flooding victim. Uh, could be a little bit more descriptive because is the blood still going on? You know, we, we can't quite tell. Um, and then uh, let's see what else is there. Um, Anybody else want to like chime in um, from the audience if you want to say if you have any other suggestions? But I think the, it's really about context, and the context matters. Uh, thanks for participating in that. And the link is live if you ever want to keep trying it. And you can see what people wrote for reference. Um, so again, as you mentioned, blue sky, the home is destroyed. This woman is embracing a disaster aid relief worker. This shows, hey, we're here for you. It could be on the American Red Cross homepage to show, hey, we care. We're first to respond. We're there ASAP. So that is the context of that all text. Um, 
links is another, um, another thing that is very challenging. And um, oftentimes, missing context. A lot of times, we see links that are more click here, contact us, but doesn't have the context that we need to understand what the link is saying or what it means. So how many of you have ever heard a screen reader before? Oh, about, oh, that's a good number of you. So I'm going to play a series of videos that emulates what a screen reader is saying. And again, they're just not the one-to-one -one experience of somebody who uses a screen reader. They may have their own shortcuts. So, yeah. Link, link, in link, 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 in it, link, link, link. First steps, link, learn more. Link, 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 learn more. Link, in link, link, learn more. Department of Communications and the Arts Web Content. You are currently on web content. To enter the link, learn more. Main 26 items. You are currently on a link. To click link, image, link. I. Did you know what to click on? Did you know when you clicked on learn more, where do Link, 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 no. link, it, link, link. <laughs> That. So there's better ways to do it. You can, you can actually make the links more relevant. You can add um, hidden elements that a screen reader can pick up on, like the blog title. So this is actually a, a good compromise. So as you can see on this website, it still says more but the screen reader is going to give it more context. So hopefully I can get this video to play. Meet heading level two link. AFP response on counterterrorism arrangements. The AFP would like to respond to a number of incorrect claims made in news reporting today, Wednesday, 8 March 2017, regarding first, you are currently on a text element inside of web content, link. AFP response on counterterrorism arrangements more. Links menu. Media release, net worth dollars, three to four million seized, eight charge more. Link, link, AFP response on counterterrorism arrangements. Did that make a little bit more sense? Yeah, so you could actually have a little bit of... No, stop. Okay, thanks. So, um, you can have... Dang it. Okay, let's just stay there. So, it's really great. If you have a website like Atmos Energy, which is up here, as you can see, is the header, the main image is National Save Digging Month. Find out how to win $811 in April. That's more descriptive than learn more. So if you can, add in that context, because it helps everybody, not just screen readers. Um, having that context is really helpful. So the next one I want to show is navigation. From a keyboard user. Go ahead. All right. Now, when you are using a keyboard and you're typing through a menu, you may, as a keyboard user, may not always know if something is dropping down. So you got to make sure that when you tab to certain element in the menu, that the certain items appear. Um, and then also for the screen reader, will the screen reader know? that there's children menus that drop down. We need to add in those elements to educate the users who can't see the screen. Voice search, search, edit text, search, search one item, search button, end of search, end of banner, navigation one item. You are currently on a navigation inside of web content. List six items. You are currently visited, link, home, one of six, visited, link, information and services, two of six, link, about government, three of six. Link, news and social media, four of six. Link, about Australia, five of six. Link, my governor, six of six. You are currently on a link. To click this link, press control, option, space. Then we're gonna follow along. So one of six is helpful. So I can see, like when I go over one of six, two of six, three of six, and that helps them understand the context of where they are in that experience. So there's another one. Navigation list six items. Visited link home one of six. Link parliamentary business two of six. Link 
bills and legislation. Lord, last week, link. Chamber documents, two, link. Committees, four of nine, link. Seven estimates, five of nine, link. Statistics, six of nine, link. Petitions, seven of nine, link. Opening of the four, five, th parliament, eight of link. Records of the Parliamentary Commission of Inquiry, nine of nine, with end of list. All right. Visited, link. Senators and members. So, thankfully, all of this is achievable, if you know what those standards are. And you can actually implement them into your website to make it easier for everybody. It's going to be great for mobile, tablets. It's going to be great for down the road when we start to implement um, the voice automated technologies like Siri and Echo. And it's a lot of really exciting stuff. So really, where do you begin? Um, not here. Don't, don't worry about it. It's OK. Um, just take a deep breath because it is not as overwhelming as it may seem. Really, just take a step back and think about a site. Identify the main purpose of a site. What are you doing for an audience? And start there. Don't think about every single thing that needs to be fixed right now. Is your site an e-commerce site? If it's an e-commerce site, make sure that the shopping experience for somebody using a screen read or a keyboard is on track. The forms are accessible, the submit buttons are accessible. And what are those touch points? What is the user going to be doing in order to purchase those items? They're going to be filling the fields, they're going to be selecting a shopping cart, and, um, and then consider those accessibility elements. Can, will the user understand the field and the label relationship? Will they understand? how to check out, what they understand, where to put the credit card information, um, and think about those interactions, and how can you achieve those accessibility purposes. And then from there, what is it going to look like when you have a 10% increase in accessibility of our site? Are we looking at 10% increased revenue? Are we looking at 10% increased memberships? The opportunities are really there for you to be able to make a business case, to talk with the project teams, to talk with somebody who is in charge of the spending for the site to say, look, we have the opp opportunity to increase our revenue by making this accessible. So that is your bottom line right there. And so from there, really is categorizing by the interaction. Okay, images are not accessible. Okay, what do we need to do about it? And just kind of go from there and track them. Who's responsible for this? The content editor is responsible for quality or text. The developer is responsible for making sure that the field is there for the content editor to fill in. Now in Drupal 8, the alt text field is required by default. So that's taken care of for us in Drupal. But we, we need to identify who's responsible for what so that we can communicate in the backlog and prioritize what needs to happen. And so from there, you've done an audit in, in, about prioritizing what um, are the must-have elements. Who must, um, what must be fixed at the top of the backlog in order to improve the experience? And that's what you should focus on first. And then once you've done that, you can take a step back and be like, okay, now we've done that, we've released it. Now my customers can purchase things. Now stage two is kind of making sure that they're up to compliance, whether or not they're part of um, a federal funding site. How many of you are familiar with Section 508? A good handful. How about um, web content accessibility guidelines? Very cool. About equal number. How many of you know that the web content accessibility guidelines are now the new to be standard for Section 508. That's pretty cool. So it's really exciting. So literally, just a few weeks ago, um, the access board said, hey, Section 508, after 10 years, is finally being updated. Section 508 was written in 1998. And they're just way before modern web technologies happened. So the web content accessibility guidelines is made up of thought leaders who are saying, hey, these are the best practices that we should be doing for the websites today. And they kind of kept things up to date. So people kind of started going to the cat for best practices. And Section 508 in the meanwhile kind of became outdated, but it was still the federal standard. But now, 
the second Bible is kind of saying, look, we recognize what are they? So let's look at RECAG 2.0, because that will be the new standard. And that actually went into effect March 22nd, and by January, of t January 18th, 2018, federal sites must be in conformance with RECAG 2.0 level A and double A. So it's a lot of a lot of really exciting stuff for the, for, on the accessibility front because we are bringing these websites up to relevance and accessibility in the modern technologies, not just the outdated levels. And so it's it's a great it's a great opportunity. And so um, yeah. Okay, so I want to talk about some tools that uh, can help you along. Uh, the first one is. Uh, I don't actually know how they pronounce it, whether it's totally or toad to ally. Either way, it's a great tool. Uh, what this is, is it was made by the Khan Academy, and it is um, both a Chrome extension and a Drupal module. And it basically is like accessibility vision. Um, when you use it, when you turn it on, you get this little menu on the left side that gives you a number of different um, ways to scan the site for accessibility. Now, this is not perfect. This is not, you know, if you need to do a proper accessibility audit, um, you know, this is not really going to help you. You're going to need to bring someone on who actually knows what they're doing. Um, and that's the thing we can help you out with. But if you are looking for spot checks of content, um, spot checks of your site, this is great. Um, it'll allow you to view the alt text. It will allow you um, to, uh, you know, check color contrast, um, it just starts to overlay it. Bear in mind that this has been, they've been iterating on this. It is um, a little bit quirky at times, like right now you'll notice in the middle that it's, um, it's reading the background, uh, the contrast um, on that button against the background color, not against the, um, of, of the site, that blue area, not against the white button background color. So it can be fooled. Um, but you can take a look at the notes that it brings up and you'll be able to identify that it just doesn't know what it's talking about. But that's just, those are few and far between. Um, you know, it's also useful for spotting when you're not using proper semantic structure. It's useful for um, reading your site back to you or sections of your site back to you as a screen reader would. This is great because as you heard before, many, many, many websites torture people who use screen readers. So this is a great way for you to do quick spot checks and make sure that a screen reader user won't hate you. Another tool uh, is CK Editor, which is baked into Drupal 8. It is currently not enabled because there are uh, some security issues that still need to be ironed out. If anyone is in the room who could have an effect on that, um, you know, maybe bump that up the backlog. Uh, but CK Editor is, is mind-bogglingly useful because as a, a, a designer for accessibility and, 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 our, and, and, someone, and, and our developers who handle, who handle it, we can design and build for accessibility and then it is entirely upon the content manager to actually see this through. So a site that is perfectly designed for accessibility and perfectly built for accessibility will completely collapse if you don't have a content, a content management team that is on top of it every single day with every single word that they drop on the site, with every single image that they put on the site. CK Editor can really truly help do this um, by putting in, uh, in browser, uh, in, you know, in WYSIWYG tools to, uh, to scan this. this is, so you hit a button, it brings up this, and right now, the first thing that it has uh, spotted is that uh, this image doesn't have an alt text. You'll notice that it, uh, it's got a quick fix field right in the middle of, you know, right, right there. You can type in your alt text, hit quick fix, and it will apply it. You don't have to go back and make any changes. It's, it's literally there for you. Um, the next one, this is, uh, I'm having a hard time seeing on that angle. Uh, this one is identifying the paragraphs module is, is being used to drop headers instead of an H1, H2, H3. Um, so that's gonna baffle a screen reader that is trying to skim the site and provide an overview. Um, you can do a quick fix right there. It's giving you a drop down asking you which H you want. You select the one you want, quick fix, done. 
Uh, the next one is, has noticed, this is my favorite, it noticed that the editor didn't use um, you know, proper markup to insert numbers. Um, they, they type them in and it's just flagging it. Say, hey, fix this, delete those numbers, lasso it all and then just hit, uh, hit, hit the numbers and it's fixed. That one there is no quick fix because it's a little bit more nuanced. Um, the next one, this is uh, noticing that there was not pr proper semantic structure use. Someone jumped from an H1 to an H3, skipping H2. It's telling you what to do, provides a quick fix, done. Uh, and then this last one is noticing, this is my second favorite, that uh, the content editor has copied and pasted the image name into the alt text field, which is awful. It is worse than having no alt text because now a screen reader is getting some you know, screen reader users getting some gibberish that provides no context to them. Um, quick fix again, type in your alt text and you're all good. Uh, and then the last one is tables. Oh yes, tables. Um, this one is noticing that the ta tables don't have proper headings. It allows you to select whether you want horizontal or vertical. Quick fix, done. And uh, last but not least, we have uh, you know, another, uh, this is adjacent links. This one's really cool. Uh, it picked up that there are two links beside one another that are pointing at the same place. So a screen reader user would end up hearing that URL twice. In this case, um, if you hit quick fix, it will just merge those hyperlinks together. So it removes the redundancy, um, which is great. So again, when you are auditing your site, when you're reviewing your site, as Catherine was saying, what you want to be doing is prioritizing. You have to figure out what makes your software, what makes your website important. Why are people going to it? And focus your accessibility efforts on that because accessibility, as we said in our, our talk last year, it's a journey, not a destination. You are not going to achieve some level, you know, some imaginary perfect accessibility that you never have to focus on it again but you should always keep in mind your core functionality, your core goals, and your user's core goals. Um, you know, prioritize what you need to make your experience work. That's stage one. The next is figuring out where you need, what you need to achieve from a regulatory standpoint. And if you don't have a regulatory stand, you know, um, st standing that you need to achieve, it's good to know what status you're, you're striving for, you know, single A, double A, triple A. Um, because if you're really putting the effort into accessibility, you should make sure that your user base is aware of it. Um, if you do all of this and nobody knows it, then you've also kind of failed. Uh, and then the last is figuring out where you're going to iterate. And again, you should be looking towards your core functionality to figure out where it makes most sense for you to put the effort in. Um, you know, focus on this and do it, start now if you haven't already because you, it's, it's a long road, and it's, but it's a road worth walking. You need to do this you know, for your users. Make sure that they know that you actually, you, you really truly care about their experience, about their ability to access your information. In order to show this, you wanna make sure that you're doing things like providing tons of ways, as many ways as you possibly can, and as many ways as make sense for your user to communicate with you. Don't choose for your user how they have to communicate. Let them choose for themselves how they're going to interact with you. Um, you know, as with Catherine's you know, setup, you've, you know, don't just provide a phone because there's gonna be someone who literally cannot do that. If you have some kind of booking, you know, provide you know, a text-based you know, interaction that will allow people to book and let them call. Make sure that your core functionality is front and center there's no reason to bury your core functionality. Make it easy. Use closed captions. Um, and this is, you know, closed captions are great now, not just for people who need it because they can't hear the content. It's great because if you're scrolling down, you know, your social media feed, um, I mean, raise your hand if you've been sucked into a video you would have otherwise ignored because you saw some closed caption text. Yeah, I, me too. Um, it's useful. It's also, again, good for SEO. You don't need to put in a ton of effort to close caption. You don't need to go and sit there typing this up all by yourself. We showed this last year. We have a blog post up on our site that um, walks you through step by step, but YouTube has a freely available automatic 
closed captioning system. You upload a video, even if you upload it privately, um, YouTube's bots will go and um, analyze the audio, add the closed captions, and it's crazy accurate. Um, all you have to do is then watch it through once, identify where it messed up, and just change the word. And it's, it's easy to do because it's adding all of the timing, so you don't have to go back and do that. That was the brutal part of closed captioning before this. So anyone can do this. There are zero excuses for having videos without closed caption because you can then export them back out and um, upload them elsewhere. You don't even need to keep it on YouTube. Um, when you're displaying error text, don't just use color to indicate that something is wrong. Pro, you know, because color is not going to be helpful for your colorblind users, and it's not going to be particularly useful for your screen reader users. It's also, even if you are sighted and, you know, and, and, and have normal vision, it's kind of a pain to have to go through and find, you know, what silly, you know, tiny symbol someone dropped next to a field to indicate to you that you screwed up. Make it clear. Use text, use imagery. The more, the more that you use, the better. Optimize around touch and keyboard and mouse interactions. If you, are, if you think that touch and mouse interactions are the same thing, come find me at the phase two booths. I will happily educate. Um, alt text your images and do it properly. Really figure out why you put your, that image on the site in the first place. What was it that you intended to convey? If a blind user can hear your description of the image and move on having understood what a sighted user would, you have achieved your goal. If they cannot, you've fallen short. Um, you know, set up, use, just use proper semantic structures. Don't jump between your H's um, and don't use, um, the, don't use your H's specifically for styling. Um, I know that that is, you know, depending upon how you've set up your site, that might require a refactor in either technology or how you are um, using it. But this is an important thing. Um, Drupal 8 is a really great base to start with um, if you're looking to build an accessible site. Um, the way that handle skip links, forms, alt text is now required, um, error messaging, all, you know, and SEO, all of this is, it, out of the box, you have a much stronger experience. Um, our whole talk last year was on this, so there's a video of that if you are interested in more of the nuance. Um, we also have an accessibility uh, playbook that we put together. Um, this is a lot of the things we've talked about and some more um, that can be used to help kickstart your team. Um, you can, uh, I think Catherine has tweeted this out. Give it two minutes. She will be tweeting it out. Yeah. I'll be retweeting it. Um, but you can get that from us, and um, you know, feel free to reach out if you have follow-up questions on it. So to wrap up, when you are designing for accessibility, you are designing for the lowest common denominator. Um, we're talking about in terms of senses and, uh, and, and, and mobility and use of, their, use of their hands. This means that you are trying to build something that is as universal as you can possibly get it. What I'm asking everyone to do here is to fight for accessibility, not just push, suggest. I mean, you should absolutely be fighting for it. You should be fighting for it because it's the right thing to do. You, disenfranchising users is you know, not something that should be happening at this point. Do it for, because it's the selfish thing to do. Do it because one day you're gonna need it. If you live long enough, you are going to reach a point where you are going to say, man, I really wish I fought harder for accessibility because the web sucks, I can't see this, I can't read this, why is it this way? And the reason that, it, that you would be looking back and saying that is because not enough people were fighting for it. Some other quick selfish reasons to do this is that it's good for SEO. That will boost your site. It also opens you up to new, new markets. It opens up people who otherwise would not be able to purchase from you or take in your content. If you are doing a new site build, if you are looking out over the horizon and there is one coming, make sure that accessibility is a core part of your goals because it is far easier to build fresh accessibly than it is to start from scratch on a, uh, on, uh, sorry, than it is to bolt it on. It is absolutely doable, 
it's you know you have to focus on incremental iteration, um, and it is important if you don't have a site redesign coming up to start figuring out how you could make those incremental improvements. But if you have a redesign coming, think about what you're going to do to make sure that you are coming into compliance because you will you you will thank yourself later on if you do it. So, last recap. Do this for yourself. You're going to want this one day. Um, do, do it for your users because they are going to want it. Design accessibly for your lawyer because they're going to love you for it and you should love your lawyer. They're looking out for you. Do it for usability. A site that is built with, a, with good accessibility principles is a usable site. Do it for SEO. A site that is built with good accessibility practices is usually pretty search engine optimized. Do it because it's the right thing to do. I think we have about maybe five minutes. I think we have to give up the room. But please, if anybody has any questions, I think there's a mic in the middle of the room. Don't be shy. Oh, yay. <laughs> I'm not shy. Um, so I just wanted some clarification on alt text. Um, so are there any guidelines as far as assuming the gender or race or anything like that of the person or people in the picture, because I feel like that could potentially be touchy. Um, and also, just the length of the alt text. So some of the examples that you gave are a little bit longer than I've been guided to use in the past. Okay. So in terms of um, race, ethnicity, and other, other identifying characteristics, my suggestion would be to think about, again, the context. Is, is, the, you know, is the fact that the person a woman relevant? You know, if, you're, if you are building a site that is encouraging girls to code, absolutely, it is completely relevant. If, you are, if your site is pushing a pharmaceutical product that is gender neutral, maybe not. Um, in terms of length, we recommend shooting for the length of, you know, of a tweet. Um, and use the length that, ma that makes the most sense to convey the meaning that you need to convey. If, you're, if you've got 500 characters, you're too long. If you've hit 100, 110, you're fine. The key is to make sure that you're conveying the meaning. Yeah, can you speak to uh, some of the newer technologies like AngularJS and accessibility or basically things where you're using JavaScript to draw the screen and how screen readers handle that? Um, that is technical area that I'm not super familiar with, but we've got some great experts in the room. Yeah. We've got somebody right next to you. Um, mm -hmm. Right there, yeah. So yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of accessibility in JavaScript that is, is improving. Um, it's definitely being watched upon. And I've seen some JavaScript implemented, Angular even, go ahead. Uh, just to say that, that the screen readers work on the DOM, so you can build a, a nice, uh, framework with JavaScript that that is accessible, but but it comes down to if the community has enough people and if the if there's enough um, motivation to go up and see that the central library is being maintained and tested for accessibility. And I'm not I've heard some mixed results, and so right. it, it really depends on the library and and checking to see how how, how right. viable that is. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Mm -hmm. Oh, just a suggestion if you're going to. Um, tell people to use YouTube automated captioning. Tell them to make sure that they go through and correct the captions. Yes, because absolutely. the autom yeah the automated captioning is yeah doesn't sure. work in uh, in most conditions. Yeah, definitely. That's definitely something that we do. We do the um, automatic transcription. They we go through it doing manually. I did this talk last year. YouTube understand David perfectly. Didn't understand me. It hurt my feelings, but that's all right. So I had to go and we changed my talk. So I definitely, under, definitely agree. Go ahead. Well, to continue the conversation of, off of what you just said, if you work in the public sector, you're actually required to have broadcast quality captioning. Right. So just for any other public sector folks in the room, I thought I would share that. Yeah. Uh, and then for color contrast, I actually really like the Pasiello Group's color contrast analyzer mm -hmm. because not only does it check for different forms of color blindness or cataracts, but also lets you select, it'll give you 
color options for your palette, so it's actually a really strong tool. That's great. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Tush. I've color seen contrast it. analyzer is by the Paciello group yeah. who works with WC3. I'll tweet that out. I've seen that tool, so I'll definitely yeah, tweet that out after this for you guys. Sweet. It's definitely great. Thank you. Um, thanks, thanks, everybody. We'll be around. We'll be in the booth and um, that's this. Come find us at booth 404, I promise it's there. <laughs>